we've got half an hour now to um, for you to ask questions. You've covered a lot um, in that morning in that morning session, and you've covered quite a bit in the um, uh, in the voting sessions. Uh, and whilst you might be thinking about what you would want to ask, I've got a couple of questions. One for the panel, and one for each of you. The one for the panel is: I was quite struck in the voting how low, in fact, hardly registered, social equity came up. And yet when I think about it, I suspect that it's probably the same in TFSE as it is for England's Economic Heartland. 80% of the population that's going to be there in 2050 is already here. A significant part of that population is just about managing, can't afford some of the innovation technology, would actually just like to be able to carry on running their 10 or 15 year old car because that's all they can afford. So when we're talking about technology and innovation and doing things differently, are we actually missing out one of the significant parts of the, the question here? That's a question maybe for the panel. A question for each of you, how are you going to make a difference? Because implied within all of this is the fact that things have got to change. Now, I'm very lucky. I live in Oxford. My office in there is in Aylesbury when I see it. Um, I have a choice these days. Uh, I used to be able to only travel by car or bus. And then 18 months ago, we invested, or government invested in rail, and I, and I can choose between driving by bus or by train, depending on what I'm doing during the day or in the evening. I have that choice. When we talk about mobility as a service, there's an awful lot of this part of the world that doesn't have it. So how are we, how are you, what would make you do things differently? Because leadership comes from the profession as much as from other people having to do it. And we sometimes wonder we're in a bit of an echo chamber here. We all say this is good stuff, and then we go off and do exactly the same thing that we've done before. Uh, and we need to make something different. And particularly if we're going to address um, Rupert's challenge of what are we going to do in 12 years' time, in, in order to meet 12 years' time. So, what are you thinking? I don't know, Rupert or the team or anybody, whether you wanted to respond to that challenge about social equity, because it was very noticeable. It did not come up or did not register. Sure. Go back to the legislation. You know, what does it say? Facilitating economic development, and you've got to have regard to the environment and, and you know, social equality, if you like. I think you know, there are some real challenges. So if you look at the southeast, there is a, a contrast between urban areas and rural areas. Um, so you know, you've got to, we, we need to think about how we ensure that um, uh, we are inclusive for rural areas. And that's really quite challenging for future mobility. Um, you know, quite often there's a lot, you can go to a conference, you know, day after day on transforming cities and city mobility and stuff like that. When it comes to thinking about, you know, I live uh, pretty much middle of nowhere on the South Downs. How am I going to benefit from, you know, pay-as-you-go services? So uh, that's a challenge for us and, and it's not lost on us. Um, I think uh, the way in which services are going to change, and we talked about pay-as-you-go, so, you know, the point that you made about somebody having to maintain their, you know, 10 or 15 year old car and not being able to afford the new technology. But actually, if you move to a world where you're just paying for the journey that you take, you know, it potentially makes it more affordable. And you can put tariff structures in and all sorts of things like that to, um, to help. Um, I think road user charging again, you know, the argument will be from uh, people that, well, you can't possibly do that because you'll be penalizing business or you'll be penalizing those who are less able to afford um, to pay road user charging, you know, again, you can develop tariff structures um, uh, and for you know various bits of the network at various times of the day, and you could theoretically, um, you know, develop structures that um, recognise people's ability to pay. So, you know, all of that is not lost, and I think that you know as we step out that transport strategy into the future years, for my for my mind, you know, what will make a difference? Why why transport for the South East is different? is it is not just about the pure transport interventions, it, what else it can unlock um, around economy, environment, and that social infrastructure. I really like the phrase that Edmund used, the triple lock of sustainability. Um, and that has absolutely got to be the watchword throughout our, our, our transport strategy. Well, yeah, I, d I just think on this, the future mobility, um, I think um, you, uh, my concern in this kind of arena is that it's all being just left to kind of take its own course. And I do feel that uh, you know, as TFSC, as, as, as professionals in this area, we ought to be trying at least to try and shape this uh, thing in a way that's going to deliver the outcomes that we all really seek. I know that we're all potentially putting ourselves out of a job if all the transport planning problems in the world were solved, but 
actually that's that's why we all do it, don't we? Um, but there are some unintended you know, consequences of some of this, these models that are being talked about. You've got the car industry all right, struggling at the moment to kind of reinvent itself, but it's saying, don't worry, people, it will, you, you won't have a, your, you know, your, your car, once it's clapped out, you'll have an electric one, but you'll be, it'll be your own thing that you will own. Um, and there is this, and Jesse Norman talks about it, you know, he's a philosopher, and he talks about this, and, and it's quite a powerful thing, he talks about a, you know, a vision of mobility in the future, a dystopia, where there's, everyone is travelling around in pods, individual pods, you know, on their, on their iPhones, um, and, and all the infrastructure that's required for all that indi individual mobility tends to still dominate our uh, urban areas. Uh, and then this idea of a utopia where, you know, it's not all about individual people in individual pods. It's more about shared mobility, towns and, uh, you know, can breathe, you know, all the infrastructure isn't all about providing for individual mobility. There's more, you know, uh, more, more space and green space in urban areas. And I think, you know, there is something about us trying to, uh, you know, shape the, as much as we can, influence the, the future of this m the new mobility in a way that is going to deliver the outcomes that we're all, uh, you know, all, all ultimately seeking. I think clearly we've got to see that there is a real um, connection between um, the, the, those social objectives and the economic objectives. So improvements to kind of air quality, health and access to facilities, um, which drive improvements to um, social inclusion. Uh, as well as uh, kind of improving access to deprived communities in the area, will have an impact of driving economic growth as well. So um, I think bringing, bringing people along on the journey um, uh, and showing that actually that, that triple lock um, of sustainability um, is what's needed um, is, is part of really what the transport strategy will do. Thank you. I suppose there's a question and a comment really, just in terms of generally the the, the transport strategy and what it's trying to do. Um, the, the kind of corollary to what you were saying, really, Martin, about 80% of the people are already here. You could say the same about business and jobs. A lot of those are already here. The jobs, the people in those jobs will change, of course. But um, it's almost like a double-sided coin to me. So on one side, yes, you've got all the, uh, the USPs, I think it was referred to earlier, for the economy in the southeast, uh, international gateways, focus on interurban and all that kind of stuff. Um, that's one side of the coin. The other side of the coin, which hasn't really been spoken about, is the productivity and performance of the, of the, the rest of the economy, if you like, the bits that maybe aren't so sexy, the, the local accountancy firm, the shopkeeper, the, the, the plumbing firm that employs 30 people, or whatever it is. What is this strategy going to do for uh, those jobs and those bits of the economy, which probably make up the vast majority of um, TFSE's economy as it does anywhere else? Uh, High-end ceramic products for gin industry. <coughs> We're able to do the same, if not higher, levels of productivity with fewer people. So the point about the productivity question is actually a really important one. Mm -hmm. So how is that maybe being reflected in maybe the work either Mark or Edmund? Do you want to touch on that? It's a difficult conundrum. I think the interesting data that when, when the strategy comes out for you to have a look at, which I was quite shocked by, is just, you know, just how, uh, talking about technology, what a massive impact technology is going to have artificial intelligence particularly on jobs over the next 30 years and we've already started to see some of those trends emerging particularly around retail that's something that's been sort of known about everyone's you know, shock and awe about uh, what's going on in the retail sector but there are artificial intelligence and the potential impact on that of him on employment I would suggest is going to turn over some of what you you were saying and there again there are some potential some consequences of this that and that's what I think the government's industrial strategy is uh, driving at is that this artificial intelligence is coming it's going to be massively disrupting uh, disruptive it's going to change the pattern of employment particularly across our geography and this is something that we're building into the uh, demand forecasting because the pattern of movement could you know at the 2050 look completely different if you play that through because the, 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 the different employment sectors will have morphed um, you know there'll be less people in certain you know uh, sectors and certain and more in others um, and there's all the productivity consequences of that. Is there going to be you know, more people in, you know, more employed, uh, more people in highly skilled jobs, but then what happens to those people you know, who, who, are, uh, who haven't got the skills to, to fill those jobs? So there is some, and we're trying to play those through, some of that demand forecasting, but we, we didn't show you the detail today, but it will be there, uh, and, and, and trying to anticipate that in the, in, in the strategy document. 
are those reflected in the scenarios that you're yes, developing, yeah. are you? I mean, not, I, I, the, the, you heard when Edmund was introducing the scenarios, some, the, the, some of them are really driving. There's one called uh, uh, Future Technology, which is like a sort of this uh, situation where artificial intelligence is just left off the leash and free market economics, and, you know, and, it, and it just goes crazy. And you get massive increases in, in productivity, but employment, dis unemployment goes through the roof because there are so many people who are left behind. So it, it is a, you know, we have tried to capture that, um, that in one of the scenarios, um, but just to say that that isn't something we're saying is, is going to happen, but it's one of the tests we think we should take the transport strategy through to sort of stress test it to say, well, if that did happen, what would, the, what would you need to do to the transport system to support that? Um, as an institution, a couple of years ago, we did a bit of work um, facilitated by Glenn Lyons around a thing called futures, and the idea is about creating policy scenarios. And we, I think we used about 300, Andrew, I'm looking at you now, it's about 300 we had, wasn't it, of our members involved in the... Okay. But the point was, you, we created, the, through, with the membership, cr um, created four plausible scenarios for the future. And what was interesting is being professionals with different views and different opinions, it was pretty evenly spread across each of those four scenarios as to what was perhaps plausible and desirable. What I found really interesting was the fact that only one of those four scenarios relates to the framework that we use to assess things within the Department for Transport. So if that's a profession, we know there are four plausible scenarios, but only one of them is actually manageable and measurable through the, um, the work that we do at the uh, Department for Transport. I think it comes back to Julia's point about actually there's a challenge here about how do we unlock some of the funding mechanisms because actually we need a different way of doing it. So there is a, a board structure in place. Um, uh, the way the legislation defines it is the relevant authorities are the local authorities. They become the constituent authorities. Um, there's 16 of them within the Transport for the South East area. Um, we also have five local enterprise partnerships operating within the geography. Two of those are co-opted to join the board. Um, we also recognise the importance of the link to housing uh, and so we have a borough and district or local plan maker uh, representative on the board and then it won't surprise you to know that because of the uh, landscape designations that we've got we pull up um, someone from the South Downs National Park who actually chairs National Parks England mm -hmm. to advise the board on um, uh, uh, landscape related matters. Um, supporting that, we have a transport forum which pulls together operators, transport focus, other user groups, um, uh, infrastructure providers uh, uh, that's chaired by an individual who also sits on the board. So we bring together quite a wealth of knowledge and experience. Um, underpinning how the board operates is a, is a constitution um, that describes uh, um, you know when voting is required and so on and so forth but I mean the shorthand is the transport strategy has to be agreed by the board all the decisions that they've made to date have been through consensus they have they need to go for a sh to a show of hands um, uh, I, you know I'm sure there are going to be challenges ahead but the chairman is absolutely clear the minute you go to votes and have to pull in you know a constitution that says I don't know Kent because they're massive get 11 votes and all of this then actually all is lost um, the key is keeping the grouping together, um, keeping them uh, uh, up to speed with the journey that we're going on so you get that buy-in all the way through so that when you come to key decision-making points, you know, the board is making decisions on the basis of consensus. Uh, and, you know, we've tested that a few times. Uh, the board's been running since June 2017 in shadow form. Um, you know, the board has prioritised what they believe are um, uh, the key priorities for RIS2. Um, and you know that when you start to ask a group of elected politicians where in the geography they should put their um, their their, their uh, uh, emphasis, you know, you, you would think that is, there's going to be controversy. Um, but to give them their due, um, you know, they recognise the the importance of speaking with one voice. So, although the legislation says the Secretary of State has got to have regard to the transport strategy and setting transport priorities, um, actually, if you've got a bickering group of politicians, he's not going to do anything. Uh, and the members know that, the board know that, that in order to get traction, they have to genuinely speak with one voice. 
and I think that is what works in our in our favour. Yeah, just qu just quickly, I think on just to answer you, the specifics on some of the stuff that's more controversial, like road user charging or air quality. I think they kind of foresee a situation where it would be possible for them to take a collect a, a collective decision on something that we were going to do it across the region, rather than that something that they wouldn't countenance in their own patch individually. So I think the the structure and the kind of the way of working that we've developed, if we can maintain that, offers the prospect to get stuff that you, as you were identifying, is slightly more politically controversial through a decision-making process because there's that, <coughs> it's not any one of them, it, they're making that decision collectively and they all feel therefore comfortable with the, con, you know, the controversy it might, it might generate. One of the things that came out very clearly for me was a reference from, or the, a view from the, uh, the audience here about it's the long-term certainty beyond the four-year cycle. Um, I remember in a former role in the southeast, which had a map that looked very similar to the one you've got now. Um, but I seem to remember tales, um, true I believe, of uh, Highways Agency at the time buying and selling properties along the A27 at Worthing twice or three times because of that lack of certainty. Mm -hmm. Is there a way in which the STB is going to try and look at how to overcome that four-year, five-year political cycle in the way it uses its programming approach, perhaps, to major investment? Getting a pipeline. Uh, a clear pipeline, giving certainty to the market, certainty to residents, users is important. Um, I don't think we're ever going to get away from those political cycles. There'll always be something that gets thrown up, be that at you know, government level, who knows what's going to happen in the next few weeks, um, or, or, or locally. Um, you know, that will always bring a, a dynamic. Um, I think you know, we have clearly set out how we operate. Um, there's a set of values, set of behaviours um, that the members are, are, are signed up to. Um, so even if there is a political change, um, I think there'll be a strong enough cadre of uh, a board to, to take through decisions and um, think about the longer term. You know, the board have agreed that that transport strategy has got to step out to 2050. Um, you know, they recognise that this is a long game. Um, and, you know, to be fair, they're all fairly you know, well-seasoned politicians and understand, you know, the pitfalls. Um, uh, and I think that's you know quite important in getting them getting them cohesive. Edmund, you mentioned engagement with the youth council, but I was just wondering more broadly how that was being factored in because the pace of change is just phenomenal. It really is. Uh, uh, you're absolutely right, and uh, it just reminds me of what my daughter said to me. I gave her that sort of talk about you know being safe on social media, and I said you know Facebook. If you go onto Facebook, she turned around to me and said, "Dad, Facebook's for old people." Mm -hmm. So the, you know the pace of how quickly we become out of date is is incredible. Um, a lot of the local authorities operate youth councils and youth cabinets. They're a really good source of um, uh, intelligence. So, you know, in my own area, they have what they call a big vote each year, and they decide what are the priorities for the age group, you know, sort of 12, 13, through to 18, 19. Uh, and we include people like care leavers within that as well. Um, uh, and you get a really interesting... So, you know, in the big vote in East Sussex at the moment, the thing that bothers them the most is knife crime. Um, even though East Sussex, you know, it's not a big issue, believe me. Um, but, you know, because of the way the media portrays it, for them that's a big issue. Um, uh, you know, if historically they've talked about transportation and they've got some really strong views on, you know, digital, digital economy, how that's growing, um, connectivity. So for us, as we develop our transport strategy, we will be looking to engage with these younger groups to make sure we get their views. And equally, uh, someone mentioned the demographic earlier about older people. Um, you know, there are seen what, what's called seniors associations. I mean, perish the thought. Apparently, you're a senior when you get to the age of 50. Um, uh, <laughs> but, you know, we've, we've got to, you know, we need to engage with that different demographic as well. And you quite often hear people talk about, well, it's all very good, everything big on the internet, but older people don't use it. Well, actually, we've got to wake up. They do. Um, and they're really capable and really competent. And I know that, you know, I, because my day job covers all place-based services, so I have the joy of libraries and trading standards and planning and road safety and all of these things, uh, uh, including broadband delivery. I absolutely understand that the older people, in some respects, are more switched on with this stuff than yeah. we give them credit for. What's um, the internet? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, we need to think about, uh, you know, not just engagement with uh, younger groups, um, professionals like ourselves, but also that older demographic is going to be key as well. As we know as subnational transport bodies, it's actually a broader agenda because one of the things we know, where's the biggest cost to society moving forward? It's the elderly, the care, 
the support for that. We also know that if we can help people retain their independence for longer, they live longer, have less demand on health services and social care. So actually it's a win-win-win for the, the society as a whole because we help them maintain the mobility and accessibility. And there's some of the things around the technology innovation, whether it's digital, whether it's autonomous vehicles, where potentially, you know, potentially these are quite game changers, but it does mean to say we need to think very differently about how we plan for the future. The scenario comes back into again. Other questions? A quick one on linking um, two things. The importance of health you talked about as, as sort of a, one of the drivers uh, as well as transport. Um, planning. Um, so when you talk about highway powers, is that highway powers that link to planning of developments as well? So do you ever see that Transport for the South East would get involved in where developments are situated to make them sustainable, healthy developments? In terms of our mission and what we're trying to do and this whole kind of agenda of regeneration, we're not, we're, we're not a planning authority. We have no powers and there's no intention at the moment to um, sort of roll back out uh, th those devolve those powers uh, or, or give us those powers to operate in a sort of spatial planning context but it is something that we grapple with the whole time because it's it's such a big part of this whole equation and our in inability at the moment to influence what is I'd say as it is a, dis a, a dysfunctional system with piecemeal development here there and everywhere leading to you know all, all those uh, those um, you know uh, suboptimal outcomes in terms of where development's located and the transport infrastructure to support it, it is something that, you know, we are, you know, through, through our mechanisms, through the joint STB working, sort of continually having a debate about, about how um, we, um, you know, how we get that kind of uh, thinking back into the arena. Now, as I said, once, because our transport strategy is looking out to 2050, and the local plan regime is, uh, you know, it, it sort of the local plans that are there at the moment sort of start coming to an end 2030s, early 2030s. There is the ability for us to look and be a bit, a bit bolder, looking out further into the future about a more transport-led development scenario rather than, you know, the, the other way round. Um, but we haven't certainly got the powers to implement that. We're reliant, you know, in the current system on others to step up and do their bit to make the blueprint that we're uh, putting forward um, come to fruition, and that's just how it is. Um, but whether that needs to change in the future is, is something that, yeah, probably, probably needs debate, you know, further debate. First mile, last mile versus strategic. Is, do you have a view about where the balance should sit in the transport strategy on that? First mile, last mile, you know, every journey begins and ends somewhere. But I mean, it's a, this is again where kind of our relationship, we have to manage that relationship, particularly with local transport authorities in terms of, you know, how what we're doing at this regional level, this big blueprint, um, and how that, how that dovetails in with the good work that's already going on with the LEPs and with the um, local transport authorities through the, you know, through their local transport plans. And I think it's, it's, a, it's obviously from a whole journey perspective, it's something that needs to be, uh, we, we need to encapsulate within the transport strategy and make sure the golden thread is there. But as for the sort of the relationship and how we make that work, um, that's for us, you know, in terms of developing that mature relationship with our constituent authorities to make sure that we're all singing from the same hymn sheet. So the first mile, last mile element is, is um, you know, is an integral part of, uh, uh, of what, we're, what we're setting out. Rupert, did you, want, did you just want to reflect upon the whole morning? Thank you. Uh, for, for listening to what we've got to say and for being part of it. Um, I guess, you know, this is the part of this is the start of the journey. Um, you, you, we can't do this, you know, Transport for South East can't do this alone. Um, uh, you know, we, we, we've all got skin in the game in terms of getting that um, transport infrastructure right. I think that, um, I suppose, it's probably what, the fourth, fifth time I've said it today, go back to the legislation, it's about facilitating economic growth, it's about all the social and environmental um, uh, aspects that we've talked about as well this morning. Um, I, 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 we are different, uh, you know, we, uh, and I talked about not having a single piece of infrastructure that's going to be the silver bullet to all the economic woes of the South East. Um, it is a range of things uh, and I think, you know, part of what we're doing is focusing not just on the, the obvious, um, you know, improving reliability and pinch points, but it's trying to stretch our imaginations and minds out so that we generally focus on what the future of my mobility might hold. Um, and that's quite challenging. 
um, in, in terms of you know thinking about what that's going to be. Uh, and I guess that's the part that we can't do alone. Um, so our relationship with you uh, is, is, is really important. Um, I, I'd be delighted if you're all putting your names down to you know, keep abreast of transport for the southeast. And there are going to be times that we'll want to tap into your knowledge and you know, potentially do more events like this yeah. um, so that you know, we can genuinely deliver this. And I know it sort of feels a little bit cliched, but it is a partnership. And, you know, the challenge I the sort of gauntlet I threw down at your feet at the start of this was, you know, we have 12 years just from an emissions perspective to start to really change how people move around. Um, you know, as professionals, we've got that opportunity to be a bit brave. You know, we're going to stick our necks out there um, uh, and be brave around mobility. And, you know, we hope that you're able to, um, to join us and really bring about some transformational change for communities and the, and the people that we're seeking to, to serve. So thank you very much for, for the opportunity to address you all today. We're heading towards a spending review this autumn. We know that it's going to be tight. We know that actually collectively as a profession we're going to have to make the best possible case for investment both capital and revenue in infrastructure and services because if we're going to deliver that aspiration for economic success which actually brings all the other things that we're looking for in terms of society we need to be successful in getting that money for investment but as um, Rupert's reminded us a couple of times already today um, we've got a very limited time frame to actually make a change um, and even if today uh, I work on uh, a project called East West Rail which I think is about 20 years I've been working on it and we have got the full support of the Secretary of State to get the next stage or one of the stages of that delivered by the late uh, 2020s, around about 2028, 20, 28, 29. So anything we decided now isn't going to be there in time for that deadline of 2030. So we've got to really do some quite fundamental different things. As an institution, we're looking at how some of the certainty and funding for local government can actually help for that. At a national level, we've got to make the case. At a regional level, you've got subnational transport bodies taking the, the way forward. So please do take up the offer to get engaged with the guys at Transport for South East. Um, we work together as STBs. We will make that case collectively as well as individually. And with your help, we'll be able to make them uh, much more effective and hopefully have a really strong voice going into the spending review this autumn. Um, just a few things for me to kind of say by way of wrapping up the whole morning. Um, first of all, just to say um, the presentations will be available uh, in due course. There will be a link sent to you. I doubt, though, um, Adrian, that uh, you'll have the ability to vote yet again on the... No, the, the uh, you're not sat there on your uh, computer waiting for the next two or three to come through. So just ignore the, the questions, but the content there will hopefully, helpfully... Uh, and I know that in Edmonds there was quite a bit there that you'd probably want to have a look at and maybe help come back to. Um, I want to thank WSP for sponsoring this event. Uh, I want to thank Transport for the South East for bringing along the content, because without the content, it's nothing. And our colleagues at ACO have helped with the uh, filming of this and the, uh, the presentations. Um, you'll also get a short link, uh, a link fairly shortly with a feedback form. Um, and just as an added incentive for you to fill out and take a few minutes doing that, there'll be a £20 vi a prize voucher for one person who's picked out at Ramson, random from Amazon. Um, You've been in Britannia Walk this morning, home of the Chartered Institution of Highways and Transportation. It's 10 years since we've been here, uh, since the Princess Royal, our patron, uh, opened this very building. So it's a, it's a nice anniversary this year. But if you're interested in being members of the uh, institution, whether individually or corporately, we have a very strong corporate partner uh, uh, programme, which we're about to extend into uh, education and local government. Please feel free to talk to either Justin or Theo or anybody else from the staff who are here and I think it just leaves me then to say thank you to you. Um, thank you for coming along, for being part of the discussion, for contributing. I hope you found it uh, stimulating, um, a start of a conversation with the Transport for the South East uh, colleagues um, and with that very happy thought, thank you very much. Thank you.